Continuing to look at the book of Luke, the red letters, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ from Luke's perspective. We're going to be looking tonight at Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 30, making it through the narrow door. Now, of course, this is a passage of scripture that uh, we're all quite familiar with tonight, but I, I hope to open our understanding a bit more and, and help us to possibly comprehend and understand a bit more of what our Lord Jesus was trying to get us to understand and, and getting those hearers at that moment to understand in order that they could be prepared, in order that we can be prepared for His soon arrival. You know, heaven is a topic that we've heard about since a very young age often seemed somewhat mystical, if you will, when we were very young, when, you know, the, the conversations that were being generated about it. But as we mature, our thoughts of heaven often begin to change. And I hope they do, they do change. I hope that as we're maturing, our understanding and the concept of heaven matures as well. You know, as children, uh, I don't know about you, but... I saw myself very much like one of the angels. You know, that was kind of the indication that, uh, you know, we, we understood the angelic beings in somewhat uh, of, a, uh, of a unique way. And, and I believe that probably that was the closest thing we could come to comprehend in our young minds, uh, you know, what, what heaven was like and, and what we would be. But, you know, as we grow older and we get into the Word, we begin to find out that heaven is a place filled with great mansions. Heaven is a place with streets of gold. Heaven is a place above all where the throne of Jesus Christ and our Father God sits. Where His kingdom is at. And as we matured and we listen more and more, we begin to see heaven in this way as Jesus described it to us. John 14, Jesus tells us that in his father's house were many mansions or many dwelling places, depending upon the translation. John, over in Revelation 21, described the new Jerusalem in greater detail, just describing the great glory and the awesomeness that really goes beyond the, uh, the very imaginations that uh, you and I can even begin to concoct within our own thinking. While the wonders of it all escape our total human comprehension, the means by which we attain such a glorious place do not. Jesus and then Paul the Apostle share time and again God's glorious plan of salvation. And the means by which each of us and all humanity can attain heaven. The problem lies in the fact that many who believe that they're going to heaven, as Jesus indicates, aren't going to make it. The passage of Scripture before us points out this fact quite clearly and definitely. You see, we can have many mindsets, many understandings of how to get to heaven, but Jesus made it very clear there's only one way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Whereas the world gives us a vast array of means to get to the heavenlies, whatever that particular religion may be teaching the heavenlies really are. But we understand, and Jesus proved it by His resurrection and His ascension, that His means is the only way. <laughs> And so, the problem lies in the fact that many will think they're going to get to heaven, but they've missed the way. Similar to our thoughts and questions today are the thoughts and questions that were posed directly to Jesus as he walked upon this earth. And Luke 13, 22 and 23 opens up this way. It says, he went through one town and village after another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. Lord, someone asked him, 
are only a few people going to be saved? The conversation opener here for what Jesus would have to say hinged upon this question, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? You know, I, I think that we would do well to really think about this and really consider because what Jesus is going to say, uh, the other gospel writers write about it as well because this is a very, very important aspect. The world teaches many ways and the broad way, if you will. Many go there, but there's the narrow way and Jesus said very few find it. To help clear our hearts and our minds of any wrong or preconceived notions, uh, you may have concerning entry into heaven, I want to read and consider Jesus' response to that question because that's what matters tonight. What did Jesus have to say? Because that is what concerns us as a people today is the response of Jesus Christ. This is what he said to them. He said, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because I tell you many will try to enter and won't be able once the homeowner gets up and shuts the door. Then you will stand outside and you'll knock on that door saying, Lord, open for us. And he will answer you, I don't know you or where you're from. Then you will say, we ate and we drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, all you evildoers. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place. When you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are thrown out. They will come from the east and the west, from north and south, to share the banquet in the kingdom of God. And then he says, note this. Some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. Entry into heaven involves understanding and implementing these following three important truths into your life. Entry into heaven involves understanding that there is only one door into heaven, and that is a narrow door. Jesus makes that very clear in this passage. There's one door. I know we used to sing a song, one door and only one, and yet its sides are two. You know, and, and that's it. And it's a very narrow door Jesus talks about. Not in saying that, you know, it's going to be hard to squeeze through it. It's going to be that there is only one way to get through it. And because of man's own de divisiveness, man's own uh, way of thinking about it, man's own trial and error on his own part without looking into God's way is never going to be able to slip through that narrow door. Because his mind has something else in, in, uh, in mind at that time. In John 14, 6, and I've already uh, made this statement, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Over in Acts 4, 12, Peter made this declaration. He said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. I like that he says we must be saved. He said there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus. And that is why it is so imperative, folks, that we declare the name of Jesus Christ in our world today. You see, God is a very broad concept, if you will, in the minds of humanity. I mean, God can be anything from the puppy dog on the front porch to, you know, some far out being out there as far as the thoughts and concerns of humanity are. But when you begin to narrow things down to the fact that Jesus is the way, people begin to understand that Buddha's not going to do it. Confucius isn't going to do it. Muhammad isn't going to do it. Jesus is the only way. You begin to bring that broad range of thinking of humanity down to this very narrow path that he's talking about. In today's world, these declarations that Jesus and Peter made strongly oppose the political correctness that has overtaken our Western society. 
Such daring declarations made in a growing number of Western society can actually bring legal charges against the herald. And I tell you, those are growing in number, those societies that say if you make such explicit declarations, we're going to have to do something about you. Religious pluralism has become the accepted norm. It's okay what you believe, this is what I believe, but you can believe what you believe as long as you have a strong belief in whatever it is you believe in, you're okay too. And that's the thoughts of the world today. Just believe firmly in whatever it is you believe in and you're going to be okay. And yet we know that that goes in strict opposition to the Word of God. It is strictly opposed to the Word of God. Most people today deny a one-way-to-heaven stance, choosing to be in agreement that there are many ways. There's a Baha'i temple near Chicago. It has nine entry doors, and each one represents a different major world belief system. Thus, they are saying that you can approach God through any one of these entrances, and you're going to be okay as long as you're sincere in going through and stepping through and in your belief in that system. They teach you can be totally sincere in your belief and you find yourself, what I want to say, sincerely wrong. So many paths that the world has established in order to avail himself to live as he wants to live. Because you see, when we begin to declare the truths of the Bible, we begin to see that there is a de declaration of morality. Jesus said, God said, be ye holy as I am holy. Writer of the Hebrews said, without holiness no one will see the Lord. You see, the world doesn't want to live by a holiness prerogative. We want to live like we want to live. We want to do what we want to do. Certainly, we want to believe in Muhammad over here and follow his path and know that we're okay. But we still don't want to live by the strictness of your Bible and of your word. Claiming there to be only one door to heaven is considered a very narrow-minded approach in today's age of enlightenment. To add insult to injury, Jesus took the issue a step for, further by declaring that one door is a very narrow door that very few are going to find. It's imperative to understand that Jesus said, I am the way. Not I am a one of many ways. I am a way. No, he said, I am the way. He is the only way. And we've got to learn to trust in that and to teach that and to declare that he is the only way to that one narrow door that remains open at this point in time. Belief in anything other than the fact that Jesus alone is the way ends in eternal disaster for the individual. And that's what Jesus is saying in this passage when he talks about the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Where he says, get away from me, all you evildoers. You see, Jesus is declaring to all of us, if you don't find that one door, you are hell bound. That's it. Jesus declared himself to be the only door, the narrow door, and very few find it. Secondly, we find that entry into heaven involves understanding that heaven's door involves knowing God by knowing Jesus. You see, we've got to come into that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And by coming into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we are drawn into a relationship with the Father. Jesus declared in John 10, 27, He said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Are you one of His sheep today? Are you one of his sheep that he was talking about? It's these sheep are the ones that are going to find that narrow door. In our text verse, uh, verse 25, we find people standing at the door and they're knocking and they're insisting to be let in, but Jesus tells them, I don't know you and I don't know where you're from. 
Shocker. People said, but, 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 look at all these things we've been doing. You know, other gospel, uh, other gospel accounts of this talk about them, them saying, but you know, look, look at all the great things we did in your name. We, we cast out demons. We healed the sick. And yet he says, I never knew you. Why? Because you never enter into that personal relationship with him. You want to declare his power? But you don't want to declare the, what it takes to draw into that personal relationship. To come to the foot of the cross and to surrender at the foot of the cross and to declare Him to be your Lord. Because you see, our world today, it's hard for us to you know, lay self aside long enough to declare anybody to be Lord over us. Why do I need a Lord over me? We need a Lord because it was His blood that was shed for us. It was His blood that flowed down that cross as He gave His life and the wrath of God was poured out upon Him as He hung there for all the world to see. <clears throat> Simply believing that there's one door is not adequate for entry because I'm sure there's a lot of people that have read this verse before. May I understand? Yeah, there's one door. But just believing that there's one door isn't going to get you through the door. Understand, Jesus tells us there's more. There's this personal relationship that is necessary between He and the Father. Otherwise, you're an unknown to them. As He has said in these verses. John 17, 3, Jesus says, This is eternal life that... They may know you, the only true God. This was his prayer to the Father, his high priestly prayer. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. You come into that divine relationship with the Father through the Son. In his teaching recorded in Matthew 7, 22 and 23 in the Sermon on the Mount, here he says, on that day, many are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? And didn't we do a great many miracles in your name? And he says, I never knew you depart from me, you lawbreakers. I used to have a lot of trouble with that verse. I used to, I used to wonder, well, you know, how are you able to carry out these things and not be full of the Spirit of God? And yet Jesus makes it very clear. You know, these people, he, he doesn't say, no, you never prophesied in my name. No, you never cast out demons. All he says is, I didn't never know you. You see, eternal life is knowing Jesus in a personal way. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can walk an aisle for you. Nobody can, can do a, a confessional prayer for you and a prayer of repentance for you. This is a personal act that each of us must come to the place in our life where we make that act of confession and repentance before God. There's no formula. There's no right answer. There's nothing else you can do or say. Coming to Jesus accepting His sacrifice for your sins and entering into a personal relationship with Him is the only way. The narrow door, entry through the narrow door is based upon your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus clearly declares the necessity of this personal relationship when he tells his <laughs> listeners in our text verses, verses 26 and 27, he says, they say, we ate and we drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he says, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me. And he calls them evildoers. Adding insult to injury there, you know. He says, I don't have a clue who you are. That personal relationship. Finally, we discover that entry into heaven involves understanding that the door choice will result in only one of two things. 
delight or destruction. And I added to that, choose carefully. You see, all eternity hinges upon our choice. A choice that is pretty much given to us all of our lives in one way or another. God gives us ample opportunity to make the right decision. He gives us open, open doors, if you will, constantly to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We know that as we age, those our, our, our minds become hardened, our hearts become hardened, and it becomes harder to make that response than at a younger age. But I tell you, when God really wants to get a hold of us, He can shake us through His Spirit. You see, God loves us, and it is not the will of the Father that any should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you that all includes the worst human beings that ever lived on the face of the earth. Amen. I'm talking about the most treacherous of humanity. That all includes them as well. In our text here, Jesus speaks of the destination of destruction for evildoers. It's a place that he refers to as a place filled with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whereas he describes the destination of delight for those who have entered into a personal relationship with him to be at his banqueting table. To be at his great feast, if you will. Regardless of what the world may tell you, there are only two eternal destinies. There are those religions, of course, that will tell you that once you die, you die. That's it. You know, you put in the ground, the atheist will tell you there's no God. Once you live it up on this earth, that's all you've got. So do your best and, and off you go. And it's over with once you pass on. But we know that's not true. We, we know that we know that we know the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Prove that to be wrong. Prove that fact to be thrown out the window because Jesus Christ came up from the grave. He came up victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And today we have the promise of that resurrected body, resurrected, resurrected spirit that will live with Him forever and ever. We understand that in the last days the trumpet will sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain are going to be what? Caught up! Raptured! To be with Him forever and ever. I'm telling you, the, the, the environment of our world today is ready for it. I'm telling you, that the, the evil that's going on in our world today shows us that we are in a prepared state for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Technologically, everything is in place, if you will, for the Antichrist to be able to fulfill everything that he's going to have to fulfill during that seven years of tribulation. You know, I was reading today, and it was just, uh, it was kind of an op opinion page in a Christian uh, newsletter online, and it, it made the statement, what if Donald Trump, it, well, we got a lot of thoughts going on right now, don't we? <laughs> what if he is a part of the plan of God to resurrect the third temple? I mean, he's going to be moving the embassy. Now he's promising he's advancing the time forward. You know, I don't know. It's a good thought. We've always wondered how could this happen, you know, with the, the Dome of the Rock sitting there and all these other things. And yet, the way we are seeing our world move today, you know, that's just something to throw out there, something to wonder. You know, we don't know until it happens. We don't know. We do know that there's going to be a third temple. 
Because the Bible declares it. We're going to see it in the book of Daniel here in just a few short weeks as we continue studying that. We're going to, we're going to see that temple in action. We're going to see what, what happens in that temple. And, and it, it, the Bible clearly indicates that temple has to be resurrected and rebuilt. And I believe we are moving ever closer you know, the things that are happening in the world today, the things that are happening in nations around the world today, we would never have imagined those to be taking place 10, 15, 20 years ago. Who would have ever thought that the leader of North Korea would be calling on Trump to meet with him? When you, when you think about the fact that he and his whole family have been these very, very, very vague, uh, away from the world, not wanting anything to do with other worlds, and all of a sudden, we've got this North Korean dictator who is calling on our president to meet. What's going on? What is God doing in and through all of this? Some good questions, good things to think about because I believe that God is working in and through all of these things, putting together the pieces of the end times puzzle. Because God's plan will triumph regardless of what man's plans are. Amen. And when you think that man's got it all in order and all lined out, that's just about the time God kicks in something whole, changes everything around. And it begins to perfectly line up with God's Word. And with the lining up of the nations as will have to occur in this last days. We don't know what's going to happen. They haven't met yet and we don't know that they will. But all of these things that are taking place are taking pr place at breakneck, uh, at breakneck speed today. You know, who would have ever thought five, ten years ago what's happening today in our world? You know, each one of these things should be a call sign to the world too. Jesus is coming back. Like I said last Sunday, like Noah pounding on that ark out in the desert, you know, every, every hammer, every saw blow was, was crying out to everybody around, repent, repent, repent. You know, all of these things that are working in our world are God's call to the world to repent. His call to the church, repent! Because He's coming back for a church that's without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for the blood-bought church of the living Jesus Christ. He's coming back for those who are prepared for His coming. Think about these two doors for just a moment. The one is marked by a wide path. It's easy to walk along because it's the most traveled, and yet it ends in eternal destruction. The other door, the leading up to it, is a narrow path, far more difficult to find and follow because the draw of our fleshly nature, the draw of the world around us, pulls us otherwise. And until you get control of those things through a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can never stay on that path because your flesh begins to pull you back and forth. The world begins to draw you back and forth. You see, it's those individuals, those people who are truly sold out to God that are going to be able to shut down the fleshly nature, be able to shut down the worldly influx coming in from all directions and be able to focus upon that door and head straight for that door. Folks, that's what we need to be doing in our lives. We need to be shutting out the world and the rhetoric of the world and the draw of the world. And we need to be focused upon that door. And the only thing we need to be doing en route to that door is grabbing people all along the way and pulling them on that path with us. Amen. Perhaps one of the more sorrowful things that I see in this passage about hell is the full knowledge of all the joys that have been passed up. 
Notice what Jesus says. I go back to this scripture here. He says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in verse 28 in that place. When you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are thrown out. We don't understand this, but we understand what Jesus is saying. These individuals who are cast into hell are going to have full knowledge of what they've missed out on. And it's not something that's going to go away in a day or two. They will go through all eternity. Thinking about all the opportunities that they had to find that narrow door. Thinking about all the times they said, oh, I got another day. I'm okay. Let me tell you, as I close... I want to remind us all here that God loves us so much. So much that He made a way for all of us to know Him and all of us to spend eternity with Him. But He also loves us so much He has honored us by giving us the capacity to choose. God honors our decision. He didn't make a way and then say, now you're all going to walk this path and you're going to find this way. He said, here's the way. I paid the price. Now you need to choose. Adam and Eve had a choice in the garden and we know what happened there. Mankind has had a choice ever since the Garden of Eden to choose between that which was right and that which was wrong. And we know that by the time of Noah, which was not that far advanced from creation, all man had turned to evil. Because one man and his family is all that was saved. That made God a bad God? A mean God? No, because God gave man 120 years to repent during that time. The door is wide open today for us to repent. For our hearts to be changed. The door remains open until the moment you take in your last breath. And on that day, at that very moment, your day of choosing comes to an abrupt halt. We don't know the day. We don't know the moment. We don't know when the trumpet's going to sound. But we know that we can be assured right this moment that when any of that happens, we will be taken to the kingdom of God, therefore there to be forever. Jesus says, make every effort to locate that narrow door and to enter by it. You know, there are, there are those, I'm sure, among us who find themselves insecure in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You may have said a prayer at one time or another, but you've never experienced the kind of transformation, the kind of change in your life that, you know, you've seen in others who have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, you may have attended church all your life. I believe there are deacons and elders in our churches today that aren't going to make it because the Bible is very clear. You can have all the titles. You can be a pastor. You can be a bishop. You can be a pope. You can be any of these things whatsoever. A title won't get you to heaven. Only Jesus Amen. will get us to heaven. Amen. And my word to you this evening is know that you know that you know where you're headed the moment that last, last breath comes for you. Amen. Know that you know. There should be no doubt. There should be no insecurity about your faith in Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God abides in the hearts of all humanity who is in Jesus Christ. A relationship comes through accepting Him as your personal Lord and Savior, coming into relationship with Him through His death on the cross, coming into relationship with the Father as well. Father in heaven, we